Hello, welcome to the MuseCore Cafe for today, Wednesday, October 30th, 2019. My name is Mark Sabatella. I'm the Director of Education for MuseCore, and this is my uh, weekly series of uh, chats that I do on uh, whatever MuseCore related topic uh, we feel like talking about. So <laughs> I am constantly working on many projects at once and you know i'm sure i am not unique in this but as someone who uh you know is kind of building my life around MuseScore, a large number of the projects that i am juggling specifically involve MuseScore, and so i guess i want to talk about some strategies um so um i don't claim to have all the answers and everyone's situations are different so i will as always um invite comments from anyone and also as always feel free to just ask questions on any old topic you want and i'm always happy to just uh, go on tangents um because that's what these cafes are about they're informal so um so let me just talk about some of the different projects that i am working on at any given point and then talk about, uh, I'll show you some of the maybe strategies that I'm using to juggling them. So I'm going to start by maybe just sort of rattling off uh, a few things that I'm doing. So right now you can see uh, on screen here um, a score that I am working on for uh, uh, my the theory class that I teach at uh, Regis University. And as I've mentioned before, I'm also developing an online course. And so I'm, you know, even though we have a textbook for the, uh, the theory course at Regis, I'm developing my own handouts to accompany it uh, for a couple reasons. One, so I have something to use for my online course, but also uh, we have uh, uh, the blind student, Elizabeth, who you would have seen if you were uh, following the cafe a couple months ago. Um, and so she can't access the textbook, so I'm making these handouts um, and have MuseScore all accessible so that she can read the handouts with her screen reader. Screen reader. So anyhow, um, so one of the projects that I have is developing all these handouts. Um, one of the other projects that I have going, and um, well, let me just uh, briefly talk about them. So, so developing handouts for, for my course and online course. There's also homework assignments, and some of the worksheets that I put together are going to be part of my online course, but some things are specifically just for the Regis course. Then there's music that I am creating for my own purposes. Like this past weekend, I was uh, teaching and performing at a jazz festival, and I needed to have music, some lead sheets that uh, I had you know, for compositions I had written years ago that I just needed to sort of update and uh, print out for people. But I also had arrangements, a couple of big band arrangements that I wrote more recently, and I needed to, to get parts together for those. And then a couple of arrangements for a sextet that I created, uh, well, really just one that I created uh, fresh. Um, and so those were sort of separate projects a little bit, the, the lead sheets, the big band arrangements, and the, the sextet arrangement. And um, and then, of course, as one of the developers of MuseScore, I'm constantly needing to create scores to test different, you know, things, uh, whether it's a, a bug that I'm fixing or, uh, you know, a new feature we're developing or whatever. I'm constantly needing, so I have a whole folder full of test scores that I've I've created or that people have uh, submitted online say hey this score doesn't work here what's wrong and so all, all these all these different test scores um, and then MuseScore has its own automated test system so there's scores that I create for that um, anyhow those are just some of the things I have going on um, I'm sure everyone has your own version of that right you've got multiple projects going on in your life um, and of course there's other projects I have going on in my life that don't relate to MuseScore and uh, you know that's what makes life interesting is how much is going on and sometimes we need to stop and smell the coffee yeah. okay um so uh, um but yeah i'm i'm mostly of course focused on the projects specifically involving MuseScore. now in my case part of this because i'm developing MuseScore and uh we need to be testing uh, the releases we're putting out. I actually, at any given point, have three versions of MuseScore that I'm 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 actually juggling between. There's the currently released version, 3.2.3, um, and then there's the uh, and that's apparently what I'm using right now because it just says MuseScore three up here. Um, that's the current version. But then there's also that the release candidate for the upcoming MuseScore 3.3 
that uh, um, I will I am testing often. Um, in fact, I think I would rather be on that right now, but on whatever this is where I'm at for now. Um, and then also, if as I'm developing, there'll be you know if I do a bug fix, there's my own personal build of MuseScore, not the release candidate, but my own personal build where I'm. Uh, testing some new bug fix or feature or whatever. So I, I, at any given point, I'm juggling three versions of MuseScore. Most of you don't have that going on, at least. So um, I'm going to focus on just having one version of MuseScore up at, at a time, which simplifies life a little bit. OK, so I have uh, this going on. Um, so I see that there's uh, people watching live. Um, I'm assuming I, I hear myself talking. So I know you can hear me. Um, but as always, feel free to uh, chime in with uh, comments, questions, whatever. Um, makes me feel less lonely. So um, the most important thing that I think uh, you want to have going is a really good sense in your mind of how to use folders on your computer to separate out your scores by project. And what I come to realize when I see uh, people uh, posting questions on the forum and so forth is a lot of people really just don't get folders, and that's a shame because it's not that complicated of a concept. It was it was chosen because we we deal with folders in everyday life, and it's designed to kind of uh, emulate that. So I, I just want to show a little bit of my own folder structure. So if I go to open a new score, so I'm gonna hit Control O to open a score, and actually here I y'all have seen me do this before, you know I've got a, a little utility to, uh, and, oh, these are folders that I'm, I'm, I'm going through here, right? So the utility, uh, when I click documents here, then apps here, I have this utility key press. That is the thing that's going to tell you when I've clicked a key, right? So um, the uh, um, this folder structure here, this is Windows 10. Um, Windows 10 has this concept of a quick access section here where your most commonly used folders will show up where you can access them really easily. And if there's some that maybe aren't quite commonly used enough to show up on that list because it's constantly updating this list, um, you can pin some here. So like if this apps folder were one I was using often, what I can do is I think if I right click apps and then say pin to quick access, then that would show up there, and then I could get there a little quicker. And I could do that, but that's going to steal space away from everything else, and it's easy enough for me to get to apps by um, uh, just by going to documents, which is pinned. So I go to documents, and then I can click apps, and so I, I get there fast enough for my, my purposes. But here we can see my test folder. This is where I mentioned all the scores that people have uploaded saying, hey, I got a problem with my score, what's going on, or that I um, create test files as I'm developing, as I'm trying to fix a bug or develop a feature or whatever, I'll, I'll put files in here. This is not pinned, but it's almost never not showing up as one of my most used folders. I'm constantly, constantly, it's just got tons and tons of files in it that are just coming from all sorts of places. This, you know, these are these are clearly uh, ones that someone else had said I'm having a problem with, but this one here, continuous spacing, that's probably one I created myself um, when I was testing spacing in continuous view. So anyhow, um, I at some point should clean out my test folder because it's ridiculously big and most of this stuff I don't need anymore, but I am not sufficiently organized there. So um, is core playback uh, um, going to be, uh, in, is it scheduled? So. No, it is not scheduled. The code is there. It works. And uh, right now we're focused on MuseScore 3.3. We are beginning to think about what MuseScore 3.4 will look like. Um, so 3.3 doesn't include any of the Google Summer of Code work. Um, but 3.4 might. So um, yeah, there's it is being looked at right now what what to possibly include in 3.4 and if not that then 3.5 i i i have no intention of uh of of letting that just fall on the table but i'm not the only or fall off the whatever lay on the floor i don't know the right analogy um so uh um yeah it, it, i'm going to continue to push to make sure it gets included when the when the time is right so um anyhow folders on my computer here uh when you first set up MuseScore, it will create a MuseScore 3 folder. And and some people have never even really looked at this because when you first go to create um, sc um, scores, it's going to save them to your scores folder by default. Um, 
Okay, uh, good to good to see some new names and new faces. Uh, well, new names anyhow here. Hi. Um, so uh, by default, it's going to place scores in your scores folder. And you saw how big my test folder is, and I've got tons and tons of scores and other things, but my scores folder, I have very little in it because mostly I create subfolders for all the individual things I do, like stuff that I do for Regis University is here. My Sabatella songbook, uh, the, the lead sheets that I uh, develop, uh, that's what uh, the musicians I play with uh, affectionately call it, the Sabatella songbook. So this is where I put uh, the lead sheets that I'm developing. Most of the lead sheets I did were originally done in MuseScore 2, so this folder is practically empty. It only has the couple of lead sheets that I that I went ahead and updated for MuseScore 3 um, because we uh, uh, used them uh, at this festival over the weekend. So even though MuseScore has been out almost a year, I really haven't updated most of my lead sheets yet. Um, I, I think I've played around with it a little bit, but I haven't like started to really go through. And I've got, I don't know, 100 different compositions of mine in, in lead sheet form. Um, so eventually I'll fill up this folder. But, you know, all these other folders, uh, the accessible one is like stuff that I'm doing to work on accessibility scores that I'm cr uh, converting to Braille, to Braille or whatever. Um, my courses folder, I've got scores that I'm developing specifically for my online courses. Downloads is uh, full of things that I've downloaded off of uh, MuseScore.com for various reasons. Um, and uh, even then, I've uh, like Beethoven string quartets I've gotten in their own folder. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've got all these different folders that I put things into, and test is that enormous one I just showed you. Um, under projects, though, is where I've got a bunch more, because these are like specific people. And apparently, I've got a Regis here, and I've got my other Regis, so I'm not that well organized. I just deal with organization a lot. So um, these are particular people, maybe, that I've done work for, either contract work or just people that I work with in some capacity. Um, that's my wife, Kari. Um, where I've, uh, you know, created scores for them, and I kind of like to keep their music uh, um, in its own place there. So, um, and as for why I have some scores just sitting here under projects that aren't otherwise categorized, that's probably just me accidentally saving something there that probably shouldn't even be there. But anyhow, you want to use these folders. You want to be able to organize things in the folders if you're, if you're juggling projects, um, because otherwise you end up with similarly named scores that you can't really tell apart um, by having the folder be the thing that tells you apart you know where to go to find that score so it's really useful um, if you're not already using folders a lot and actually this isn't even all my scores because these are my scores that are for things that are mostly about mu score but like um, I have a separate like where is where is this one yeah so the oh that is under um, courses okay but foundations um, foundations is the course that I teach at Regis and most of the stuff that I create for foundations or at least in the beginning wasn't uh, MuseScore files it was other kinds of documents and things my syllabus and so forth so I elected to create a, a, a folder for this outside of that whole school um, scores uh, folder uh, under my MuseScore folder but then I created a scores folder on here under here and now these are the scores that I'm creating specifically um, for uh, for that course. So yeah, using folders to keep things organized is is like it, if you've been using computers a long time, it's probably something you take for granted. But again, I see so many questions come up on the support forums for people from people that haven't really thought through this. And sometimes people say, oh, I saved this score and then I went to open it and nothing, none of my changes were there. Well, clearly, clearly what this means is you saved it to one folder and then you opened a version in another folder. That's the only way that happens. It, it's, it's just not it's just not possible that you save a file and then open it later and some of those changes aren't there. That just doesn't happen. Computers don't work that way. So if you save the file, that file is there. It's just probably in a different folder than where you're looking. And so what this tells me is that these people aren't necessarily paying attention to what folders they save things in. And as you see, uh, I'm not always paying attention either, which is why I ended up with um, uh, some f files in that... Um, See, this is the thing, it's to get to my scores folder, test is the thing that always shows up here um, because I use it all the time. That's how I get to my scores folder. I go to test <laughs> and then scores. So I've got, you know, a few files that I put under scores and then, uh, but I've got, and I put those there deliberately, but these ones that are sitting under projects, these really belong somewhere else. Um, so could video playback be a thing? 
Um, well, the thing is, MuseScore is not, I mean, yeah, and it could also do your laundry, right? I mean, there's lots of things it could eventually do, but then it the effort it takes to do that, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be like snarky about that, but it, there's like the effort it takes to develop a feature that's not specifically related to music notation that and that another program does really well um, is a effort that could be spent dealing with actually improving the notation. So when you think about video, if, if you're talking about like making a video that shows your score playing back, well, this program that I am using um, right now to do this broadcast does this job great. So this is OBS, um, which I, I don't know. I, I, I'm on Windows. Um, OBS will gladly record. Right now I'm streaming, but if I say that I want to record instead, it will gladly record a video of the MuseScore window. So OBS already knows how to do that, and it's free and open source also. So it's it feels like unnecessary duplication of effort for us to build, to spend a lot of our effort building in a feature that is already doable and that sort of defocuses us from notation. So I'm not saying it would absolutely never happen, but I will say that the overall philosophy uh, in the open source world, because we're constantly trying to do as much as we can with as, you know, with what limited resources we have, because it's not, you know, we're not charging $600 for this program. So, you know, we don't have a, a huge staff of paid developers uh, with lots of uh, free time to, to work on things. You know, we, we have to depend on what volunteers will uh, contribute effort towards. Um, so the overall philosophy in the open source world is focus on one thing, do it really well, and then work with other programs, interact with them in good ways. So if MuseScore somehow was incompatible with OBS or with, there's lots of other programs that can record videos, uh, that would be a problem and we would want to fix it. So overall, that tends to be the strategy. Now there's some gray areas there, like with playback. Yeah, I mean, we want to be able to play things back. If I, if I play this score, um, Right? It plays it back, and it plays it back with whatever you know built-in sounds we have, and we do have the ability to play back by MIDI output and to connect via jack to other um, programs. There's been requests that we incorporate what's called VST instruments or VSTI. Well, VSTI is VST instruments, so um, which are a more sophisticated way of playing things back, and it's conceivable. But given that we can already communicate with programs that do, it's a lot of work to implement that ourselves, and it does sort of defocus from the main job of uh, notating things. So anyhow, that's um, that that is my answer. So it's not like totally out of the realm of possibility that it would ever happen, but it's already possible to do and quite easy by using things like OBS. So, um, and, and then as far as organization things go to tie me back, I have a place where, well, the videos, well, that's why videos is here right now because I've been recording some videos uh, to demonstrate some, some of the new ex uh, features in MuseScore, uh, in particular some of the accessibility stuff. So the videos folder, um, this is where OBS is placing those. And then I uh, have a capture subfolder under there where I've uh, put certain things in there. Um, I've, I've created other subfolders in here, but then to keep my disk from filling up, I move those folders onto an external drive. So um, I'm constantly using uh, folders and, and being aware of where I'm at to keep things organized. Um, so. Uh, folders are a huge part of this, and when I said that people say that they've lost their work, often it's because it's saved somewhere other than where they intended. Now, I can tell you that this can happen uh, despite your best efforts. If MuseScore crashes, and then you go to, next time you start MuseScore, it'll say, oh, uh, it didn't shut down correctly. Should I restore your previous session? And you say yes. When it restores your previous session, it's actually loading files that are off in some special hidden folder where we automatically save backups. And that special hidden folder is not a folder you would normally want to try to save files to. It's, it's where we restore files from. But in older versions of MuseScore, if you then worked on that score and saved it, it would try to save it back to that file. And then because that file is one that uh, you don't have permission to save to yourself, it would actually go somewhere else you know, on Windows. It would go to some crazy place, and I, I forget where Mac does it, and it puts it somewhere else, and Linux somewhere else still. So it used to be the case that after a crash, if you recovered a score and then worked on it and saved it, 
that file would go somewhere other than where you thought it went. So uh, this shouldn't be the case anymore. It should be the case now that it goes back to the original place, although there might be cases where it doesn't. So anytime you recover after a crash, I recommend always doing a save as. So if this file had come had come as a result of recovering from a crash, and then I made some changes. Instead of just saving, I would go to File, Save As, and make sure I'm about what folder, because it'll tell you what folder it's in right now, and then offer to save it. And if you look here, and hey, that's not the folder I intended it to be, that's some weird thing. One of the clues that that's happening also is you'll sometimes see your file name change from the name, the normal name of your score to something like SCZ15329, whatever. Um, so that, that will be a sign that you're actually working on this recovered version of a file, and then you really want to make sure when you save it, no, that's not the file name you want to save to, and probably that's not the folder you want to save to. So definitely, after recovering from a crash, to be on the safe side, do a save as, so you know where that recovered file is being saved and under what name. Um, okay, so is there a different way to highlight bars other than create a line and make it thicker? Um, oh! I think I know what you're asking. Good morning, Colleen. Um, okay, so fun from playing chords through the chord symbol. So, uh, Thiago, uh, I uh, just answered that question a little earlier. Um, the uh, the f this the, what, there was a chord playback feature developed over the summer. It's waiting to become a part of a future release. Maybe it'll become part of 3.4. Maybe it'll be some other release after that. But it is definitely implemented. It works nicely. I demonstrated it in a in a cafe uh, a few months ago. Um, but right now we're focused on MuseScore 3.3, which we were starting to prepare kind of before that Google Summer of Code project wrapped up. Um, and the Google Summer of Code project is where this chord playback came from. So, um, and Chago, uh, I think I'm, or Chagu maybe, uh, I think I'm pronouncing your name correctly because I, I, I knew someone by that name, uh, a Brazilian musician, and I actually, one of my, one of my compositions is dedicated to him. So there's a piece with your name in my, in my uh, scores folder. Um, then, uh, so highlighting bars. So what I think you're asking about is like, like you see this highlighting here that I did on this text. Um, so, the, so what I think that you're asking about is you want to make this whole measure highlighted, like yellow. And the way you're probably doing it right now is adding a line, making it thicker, and making it yellow. Well, the answer is um, no, there's not a um, better way of doing that right now. That was also uh, something that was worked on for a Google Summer of Code project a few years ago, but it was never completely uh, finished. But um, if I go to this uh, music education workspace that I created, and I talked about this in a cafe a while ago, you can download it. Let me go to my uh, place and tell you where to get this from. Um, uh, music education. Uh, where am I typing? Who knows? I'm typing in here, I guess. Okay. Um, music education workspace is in school. Mastering, well, actually, let me type the whole thing. HTTPS. I think I can type this faster than I can go find it and copy and paste. News.p.educational partnership. Okay, if you go there, you will find a place where you'll see extensions. And then uh, you, you'll, it'll ask you to... Now, I think you can get to extensions without signing up. But, but, but sign up. You'll get, you'll get updates and things when I post new stuff. Um, go to extensions. Can I edit that? No, but I can say go to, dang it, not typing, go to extensions. And then you'll see that there's a music education extension. So in here, you'll see that I've created an annotations palette that has things like this yellow highlighted text. It also has this already created yellow highlighter. So I can drag this to a measure and you see that it creates it, it by default tries to put it above because automatic placement doesn't want you to put it right on top of it right away, but you can certainly do it. Um, so I put that there. Because it's highlighted, it's opaque, but as soon as I click off, you see now it's highlighted. So it's still, it is just a thick line that's been set to yellow and partially transparent, um, but you don't have to do that every time. You can use the custom palette facility. In MuseScore 3.3, creating your own custom palette. So this is already possible to create your own custom palettes, but it, it definitely takes work. 
MuseScore 3.3 makes it much, 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 much easier to create custom palettes. Uh, and so if you go back and watch one of the cafes from a few weeks ago where I show that, um, uh, you'll see that. But you'll also see it next week because <laughs> I, I, I've said this several times, but I think we really are releasing MuseScore 3.3 tomorrow. And uh, so next week's cafe topic will probably be uh, MuseScore 3.3. And most of its features I've showed before when we were in the beta um, for it or as we added features after the beta, but there's even some new stuff since then, so I'm just going to do a recap of MuseScore 3.3 next week, uh, assuming nothing else goes wrong, but I don't think anything else will. Um, ah, hello, uh, hello to all these people, oh, the villages in Florida. Where, where is the villages? I, I'm, I'm from Florida, um, uh, Palm Beach County. My parents are uh, still there, as are uh, my, uh, my, a couple of my siblings. Um, but um, so uh, yeah, thanks. I, I I totally am into these these sort of random different uh, uh, questions and things here. But l while I'm talking about this this uh, this idea that there's this music education workspace, uh, workspaces are a part of the organization process that really we could we could take more advantage of. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to close uh, this. Uh, MuseScore 3.2, and I'm going to go to my uh, release candidate build so that you're actually seeing MuseScore 3.3. And I want to talk about creating a workspace for a particular project because this is um, something that if you're juggling multiple projects, you're probably doing different things. Like maybe on some pieces, you're actually writing new music. On other pieces, it's more about just uh tweaking the formatting and so forth and maybe you you want like right now if i have a piece that i've already written and i'm just trying to tweak the formatting so i'll bring up this oxman returneth here actually um some, since i mentioned it before and it's fun um let's see again my best way to get here is test i'm gonna go it's just documents MuseScore 2. So uh, again, most of my stuff is still under MuseScore 2. Um, but if I go to Lead Sheets, Tiago. Oh, I have an arrangement of that too. But um, here we go. So I have my piece, Tiago. Um, and uh, I know the O has a different pronunciation than I'm giving it. In, at least in the Brazilian Portuguese. Um, so uh, if I want to just start like tweaking some things about the formatting of this, this came over pretty well. It doesn't really look like I, I need to do anything in particular. Maybe I'll move this below the staff. Uh, in fact, I definitely am going to move that below the staff. So click it, press X, now it's below the staff. Ooh, but it's awfully far away. Let me move it up a couple notches, control up. There we go. Now I'm happier with it. Um, this was developed in MuseScore 2, so we didn't have the jazz font for notation. So I might actually go, and here's another organizational thing here. If I go to Format, I could go to Style, and I could just change my musical symbols font to MuseJazz. I can just do that. And now you'll see, oh, the notation is in the MuseJazz font. Lady Lakes, Central Florida. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can see myself. Uh, I can see myself retiring there personally. Um, uh, this is already pretty darn good, and I might just save this as is. But ah, uh, look at this. My, my I, I know this isn't it, this isn't the way my lead sheet uh, template currently is set up for this. So what I've done is I've created a style file. I, I took the lead sheet template that comes with MuseScore, which I created and updated, and I maybe made a couple small modifications for my own purposes, and then I saved not just a template from it. In fact, I didn't save a template from it. I saved a style file from it. So if you've created a score exactly the way you like it, you can go to Save Style, and it will save all your style settings. It saves it to a folder that's called Styles there under MuseScore 3. So I previously saved a jazz style that was based on that jazz lead sheet template. So now I can come to load style and just pick my jazz style here. I've got a whole bunch of these. Some of them were just created for test purposes. Some of them, though, are ones I actually use. Like here's a um, one I use for big band scores that's just slightly different than the one that comes with MuseScore. 
Uh, in part, though, I did it not because I wanted to change anything that comes with MuseScore, but again, as for this exact purpose, I had older scores that I wanted to take advantage of the new defaults with. So I opened the Big Band template and then immediately just saved it as a style file so I could load that into an older score. So I'm going to do that with Tiago here and just um, load in my jazz style. And I think, yeah, you can see it changed the rehearsal mark a little bit. It tightened up some spacing and just did a few other things. In fact, if I reset the position of this, I'm still surprised it's as far below the staff as it is. I didn't think that was my uh, default there, but whatever. Apparently, uh, if I type Control T, I guess it's because on a lead sheet, you might have notes below the staff. And in MuseScore 2, there was no automatic placement to automatically push the text lower. Probably I could update the, the, the lead sheet template now so that uh, the text shows up closer to the staff by default. In fact, I probably should do that. Um, so anyhow, uh, ooh, but it still didn't quite get what I wanted right with the coda here. So anyhow, I'm doing all these changes. In doing this, I haven't used anything. I haven't used the node input toolbar at all, right? All I really care about at this point is some formatting stuff. So I don't even need the palettes for most of this, although in this case I probably will. But let's pretend I didn't. What I want to do is I'm going to come over here and just go back to the uh, advanced workspace. And it says advanced edited because I previously modified this in some way. But uh, let me go back uh, under view. You'll see workspaces reset. So this will set it back to the, the kind of default advanced workspace. If I decide, you know what? I don't, I, I want to see things differently. I've already made the inspector go away because um, I, I did that previously. Um, I bring it back when I need it. But so let me call this a uh, page layout. I'm going to, and in my page layout workspace, I'm going to tell it to include the toolbars and the GUI components. That means graphic user interface. That's going to mean it's going to remember my settings for whether, what, which, which windows are visible. Um, I guess I'll put that in there also. Um, so I'm going to tell it to remember these settings. When I create this, well, that's interesting. Uh, because I told it to, to remember those uh, GUI preferences, I guess it uh, picked up a, a setting that I had left over from some time before with a different color on my score. I don't know what the heck that's about, to be honest. Um, That's the paper color. Okay, why? Well, I don't like the colored paper personally. Okay, so I don't typically need the palettes. I also don't typically need the, the uh, toolbars while I'm working on this sort of stuff. So I'm going to go to toolbars here and just turn things off. I don't need that. Um, Toolbars. I don't need any of these toolbars. In fact, a better way of it, I can just right click them here. Turn off concert pitch, turn off image capture, turn off node input. I'll, I'll keep my works. Actually, I don't even need the workspaces. Well, I can switch workspaces uh, using the wind using the menu. So now I have a really clean looking uh, setup. Um, for doing the kinds of things that I might want to do. And, and, you know, if I do need to access the palettes, I can get it back. But this is a pretty cool little workspace here. And now that I've set it up the way I want, um, it should remember these settings. And so then later, if I switch to another workspace, uh, let's switch to back to the advanced workspace, I get my old setup back. But then I switch to my page layout workspace and I get that set up back right so creating workspace is a nice way so now I can I, I can work with some things like the formatting without having all those other distractions there so that's that's kind of a nice organizational thing you might have a project in which you're at this stage where you don't want to see all that other stuff so you can uh, just set up a workspace that way and that process is possible in MuseScore 3.2 and older as well. But again, this process simplifies everything about how palettes and workspaces work is, is a bit is simpler in MuseScore 3.3 that's coming out tomorrow. Um, so uh, that's a thing. 
Uh, another thing here, so let me just run over a, a couple uh, MuseScore features. I've got three scores open at this point, right? I've got the, the untitled score that started here. I've got the Oxman Returneth, and I've got Chago here. Well, Control Tab flips you between open scores. So that's something if you're working on multiple scores at once, you might want to know about uh, that. There's always shortcuts to do most things, and that's that's one of them. So um, you can move between scores. For some reason, a bunch of questions have come up on the forum recently about copying and pasting between scores. Well, this is actually, there's it's no different than copying and pasting within a score. If I want to copy and paste between scores, uh, say I want to copy these first eight bars here, I select, I click an empty spot here, shift click an empty spot there, control C to copy, and then I can go to my other score with control tab, click a spot where I want to paste to, control V, and it pastes. Now notice it didn't include the formatting, right? The original uh, Chago was in that jazz style, but this score has its own style. If I want though, I can load that same style into here. Load style jazz. Boom, and now it's got the jazz style. So um, yeah, you can totally do that. And I do that uh, reasonably often, uh, copying and pasting between scores. If I'm like, if I have an arrangement for one ensemble of a piece um, and I want to sort of change that arrangement to maybe be for different instruments, but I still want to keep my original arrangement. I just want a, a new version. Sometimes I'll just save as, so I have a new copy and then edit that copy. But other times I'll create a whole new file. Like here's an arrangement that I just did for that uh, that gig that I mentioned. Um, okay, if I go back to my MuseScore 3 folder, scores, projects, jazz combo. All right, so the Oxman Returneth, I did a sextet arrangement that we just performed. And this was based on a sextet arrangement I had done earlier. Colleen, you played on this thing if you're still there. Um, uh, you played the original sextet arrangement I did, which was for trumpet, tenor saxophone, and trombone. But for this performance that we just did over the weekend, it was trumpet, alto saxophone, and tenor. So I took my original arrangement, which was done like in MuseScore 2, maybe it was even Muse, actually it was MuseScore 1, to be honest, I think it was a long time ago. Um, so I opened that up and then I'm like, I don't want to even do a save as of this thing. It's too old. I just created a new sextet uh, chart using the jazz combo, uh, uh, template. And then I copied and pasted from the old score into this one. So then I have a score. So, uh, you know, if you, uh, we should hear a little something playback. There you go. Um, that's the, the meat of the arrangement. So, um, so yeah, this uh, I did by copying and pasting from my old uh, arrangement into the new one. So, um, I don't know, these are some of the things that I'm uh, dealing with, copying and pasting between scores, having multiple scores open at one, at one time. And I'm actually starting to use that workspace feature, as I mentioned. It's been around for a while, but it's now becoming easier to use with MuseScore 3.3. So I'm really getting into having um, different workspaces for different purposes. There was that music education workspace. Let me go back to that one. Uh, music education workspace that doesn't come with music. Oh, let me show you paid young musicians because it's fun. This is one I created for young musicians. And so what does it do? It uses everyone's favorite or least favorite, depending on how you look at it, Comic Sans, Comic Sans font um, for uh, the, the, the menus and text. It, it displays the piano keyboard by default and it uses bigger icons here and bigger text here. So this is my young musicians font, but it includes the annotations palette. Um, because you would both want to use, I would want the young musicians to use this, but I would also want maybe the teacher to use this with the students and be able to add these annotations, add, you know, add a grade uh, 
to the paper or um, you know highlight things if a student turns something in you could add highlighting to it and so forth so um, this is also part of that music education extension so if you go uh, to the link I, I posted a little bit ago and um, uh, lost focus lost focus so what is if a student turns something in okay not sure what that might mean but i'm hearing myself so i know i'm still broadcasting i see myself uh feel free to tell me what you mean by lost focus um uh but um uh so yeah this workspace is one i created that's part of that same extension and it's i i don't know that i you know it's still kind of busy looking but it, it it's a little friendlier maybe than the uh than any of the normal ones but then there's that music education one is the workspace that i've been kind of living in uh, a lot lately because it gives me that annotations palette that i'm using for things like well you saw so let's see if it remembers here yeah my natural minor scales handout um, I have all those highlighted bits of text that I was able to add from the palette there. And the palette here also lets me add text frames here. Yes, there's text frames also on this other palette, but I can just do all that kind of stuff from here. So uh, I add my text frame directly from this palette. I think I also defined a keyboard shortcut to add text frame because I use it enough, but, um, but then I forgot about it. So I haven't been using it. Um, I also use section breaks a lot, so I added a, a shortcut for that. But I could probably add a, a section break to this palette as well. And when I said it's easy, actually section breaks don't work. But if I wanted, say, rehearsal marks, this is a rehearsal mark. If I wanted them to be in this palette, all I got to do is Control Shift, drag it to the palette, and now it's there. Um, so then I can easily add. Um, well, there's rehearsal marks everywhere already. But if I go to another score and uh, click something, double click in the palette, boom, it's added. Um, it's formatted differently because the style settings were different. That's why it's running off the screen. So don't, don't worry about that. It's my style settings are customized uh, uh, for the handout to make the, the, the position look the way I wanted it. Um, so anyhow, it's very easy to add things to palettes, to rearrange the palettes and all. In, and if I want to delete it, just delete. Yeah, just get rid of it. Um, so uh, anyhow, those are some of the things that, uh, that I uh, am constantly dealing with. There's any number of other things I'm sure that could uh, be useful to people. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, yeah, we had fun playing it. Um, so sorry, I'm late. Uh, yeah, you can watch the first part later. Image is blurry. Okay, so the image blurry, I don't know if other people are seeing that as well. That means there's a bad, a weak internet connection at someone's end. And my phone is still showing this pretty nicely. So I'm going to guess that the weak internet connection is at your end. And so it YouTube is downscaling the uh, um, video. If it was bad internet connection at my end, it would be downscaling it. And I, I wouldn't be able to see it on my phone. I, it would be blurry on my phone also. But I think the bad internet connection must be at your end, um, unless everyone else is seeing it blurry. But again, it's not on my phone, so I think I think it's, um, uh, I think that's what it's about. Um, and meaning, if you go watch it later, it'll probably uh, fix itself. Um, so, uh, other questions? What? What? Any? Anything else uh, that people want to hear me uh, talk about? Because um, I'm happy to answer a few more questions before I go back to juggling uh, the things that I'm juggling. I have change settings, you the gear. Yeah, so if you go the, the within while you're watching on YouTube in the bottom right, there's the gear icon, and that's where it selects you select what resolution, and it tries to auto select based on how what kind of bandwidth you have. But I think once it goes down, it's maybe pretty reluctant to go back up. So if it was just a temporary glitch, it could affect you longer than you need to. So if you go to that gear and then manually select the HD, uh, again, it might fix itself, perhaps. That's uh, something to know about YouTube videos. So, um, and YouTube videos also then, when we talked about the fact that uh, um, MuseScore probably isn't going to have a, a, a video export feature because other programs can do it. Of course, that's the reason you would want it, right? Is so you could have a video you could upload to YouTube. But be aware, you can also do that through MuseScore.com. If I go to File, Save Online, 
and then I save my score to musescore.com, which I've already done, um, then from musescore.com, there's a place where you can export to YouTube. And I think that requires you to have a pro account, probably. Um, but uh, in any case, it will export the, uh, the video to um, YouTube. But it does it in its own way. It, put it in, insert, it adds this title to it and does this other stuff. I've, I haven't actually used that in, in many years. Um, if you use something like what I'm using again, OBS, OBS Studio it's called, but there's plenty of other programs that do this. They're screencast video. Well, it's video editing. It's not, no, it's not video editing software. It's, it's video creation software that is capable of either doing screencasting like I'm doing now, live screencasting, or um, or just any kind of thing. So right now it's doing my full screen. I could give you just me, right? Um, there's lots of other things I could give you here. Um, what else can it do? Uh, I don't want to have to name all these things. Um, so it could just do a, a, a game or just an image or oh a media source. I think that'll, if I have like a video camera connected to the thing, it'll do that. So all sorts of things like I could add text. Like I added this logo. I don't know if y'all noticed that a few weeks ago. Um, there's now this uh, Muse Score logo that shows up in the cafe. Um, and this is my full screen plus headshot. And it also has the Muse Score logo up there. So anyhow, OBS is really powerful software for creating videos that can incorporate the camera and or the screen. Um, so when I flip back to my screen here, then you'll see the video flips back um, to the screen. Um, I'm watching uh, on my phone to make sure that happens. And yeah, because it's I'm on a couple seconds delay here. So um, software like that is really useful, but there's a million other programs other than OBS um, that are capable of doing that that sort of thing. Um, but that's the the one that I'm using because it, it's, it works well with YouTube with these live broadcasts. There's other ones that if you just want to record a video are probably simpler. Um, but that one worked really well for uh, it. It allows me to do these video broadcasts. It knows how to tie into the whole YouTube broadcasting, YouTube live video or whatever they call it. Okay. Um, send, to, send to YouTube. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Oh, helpful to sheet music sales online. So is that something that you're, uh, you're having success with? Are you, uh, selling sheet music online? I and mean, that's a business that I could imagine myself getting into. It's just one more project to juggle. Um, so I'm curious, Arthur, if you're, uh, um, selling sheet music online or if other people are, are doing that and what, uh, what you're using for that. If you're like selling it through your own website, or if you're using like sheet music plus or my scores from JW Pepper, um, I think my scores from JW Pepper is the one that I'm the one that I've seen other people using somewhat successfully, um, and that you know that that would be the first place I would check out probably if I were going to be doing it. G Music Plus, okay, yeah, that's and that's the other one I'm familiar with, at least by name. Um, cool, yeah, I might look into that because I've got these, some big band arrangements and things that I feel like uh, um, would be, you know, interesting to have published. All right, so. Uh, but yeah, there's only so many hours in a day and I got plenty of projects I'm juggling already. But I think maybe after this school semester, I'll have one less thing to juggle and uh, and I'll be good. Today, uh, today was a snow day. So I'm uh, uh, we got snowed out of school both Monday and Wednesday today. So I'm now officially a week behind in my class. So that's that's good, but it's not good. Right. Um, uh, so question above about workflow, uh, you save online uh, working for backups. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, well, no, that, that, that's a, a fine backup, really. I mean, if you save online, it's saving a copy of your score somewhere where you're totally protected in the case of like a disk crash or anything. So that's not a bad idea at all. Um, in fact, yeah, that, that's, if, if you've got a pro account, cause well, even if you don't have a pro account, as far as backups go, it'll, uh, the most recent five scores will be the ones you can access and they're the ones that you're going to be presumably the ones you're currently working on so if you if you are always just you know not working on more than five at a time at least that you're trying to back up that way you wouldn't even need a pro account um, to be able to access those backups um, but worst case is something goes wrong you need to access the backup you you pay for a month of pro and then you can access all the older scores so save online is not a bad idea for backup um, I personally, um, I'm on Windows, as you've seen, um, so I'm using OneDrive. OneDrive is just, you know, Microsoft 
Windows kind of comes with that kind of, you have to go out of your way to not use OneDrive a little bit. When you set up your computer, if you use a Microsoft account, it'll automatically place your documents folder in OneDrive. And with OneDrive, it's already the case that if I accidentally screw up a file or accidentally delete it or whatever happens, all I have to do is go to OneDrive. And since this comes up often also, and since it's a little bit related to the workflow question, and Arthur, it's very related to what you did. Uh, Apple has a time machine thing. I don't, I, 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 that's what it used to be called. There's different services for, for Linux. I used to use one called SugarSync. Uh, I forget. There's other ones, I think, available for Linux. Um, but with OneDrive, what, what, what happened is I would go to, uh, if I go to some, some file here, uh, what am I doing? New score three, score, I, sh I should just put my scores folder in my quick links, but my quick links here or quick access is so full here already. I like to keep these last lots for the things that I'm currently actually working on. Um, but anyhow, so let's say I accidentally lost this score here, Campania, um, which is my demonstration for Roman numeral analysis. Uh, OneDrive, somewhere in here are my options. No, oh, that's the share option. Oh, view version history. So check this out. This is showing, uh, uh, that's not the file I want. And I have to, I have to go to OneDrive.com. Tr trust me, it works. I've used it. If you accidentally delete a file or whatever, you can often get it back from OneDrive and also, um, it's just, you know, if I go there, I can access my scores from another computer. It kind of works like Google Drive or Dropbox in that way, but my entire documents folder is in it. But you can use documents, you can use uh, Google Drive or Dropbox the same way. So if you have those configured on your computer, you could go to Edit, Preferences, and then under General, this is the default location for your scores. All you have to do is change this so that instead of being in OneDrive documents, I could change this to Google Drive or Dropbox and then and then have all my scores saved there and then Google Drive or Dropbox would be doing the automatic backup and the nice thing about that automatic backup is well it's automatic you don't have to remember to do it um, and so every time you do a save uh, I'm, I'm actually a little like yeah that versions is something different view online I guess that's the thing. I, 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 I'm like trying to remember exactly how this works. Um, but I, I guess it's that I have to go to the OneDrive website in order to actually, uh, see the, uh, all the stuff that it's done. That, that version thing is if I specifically go out of my way to create versions. So yeah, you don't need to see me log in and all that business. That's not going to happen. Um, so, uh, anyhow, OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox, also time machine i think and sugar think if sugar sink if that's still a thing so um yeah so the save online uh while you're working and yeah i do that too um not so much for backup because it's i don't know it's yeah it is some extra form of peace of mind but then i do eventually plan to share a lot of these things like this is uh, available online and I make it available online publicly um, and people can download it. My hope is as I really develop this online course that people who are uh, seeing these handouts that I'm putting there will be interested in the course because the, the online course is going to be basically me doing video lectures with these as the handouts accompanying them. So the main thing of the course is really going to be the video lecture but these are these handouts are, are pretty useful on their own so I by making them available on musecore.com I'm sharing some things of value but also then having a, an online course built around it. So um, Okay, I've been uh, talking a while and uh, lots of good questions on here. I'm happy to see as much activity as, as there's been. Um, so again, I've said this, I, I wanna say two or three times before that most likely next week, MuseScore 3.3 will be out. I At this point, it's it's looking like really, really good that it's gonna happen tomorrow. So, um, uh, so with MuseScore 3.3 out, I will almost certainly be talking about that as my cafe topic next week. As always, I'm open to other suggestions. You can leave them as comments here, but probably the best way to make sure I see it, because sometimes I don't get informed about comments. I'm not as good as I should be about like going back to look for comments later. Um, 
when I get notified, I, I can respond, but I don't know how, I don't understand the notification system on YouTube. So email mark at musecore.com is often the best way to uh, reach me for stuff like that. Um, mark at musecore.com. So ideas for future topics or anything like that, I definitely recommend this. Um, but I, I, I do definitely try to keep up with the comments here. I just, it, I, I'm more likely to see an email here. So um, I think I will uh, uh, take my leave here and get on with some of those other projects that I'm juggling. And uh, I hope everyone has a fantastic week. Those of you who are here in Colorado, enjoy the snow. Um, <laughs> Colleen, I think we still have rehearsal tonight. Um, but uh, at least I haven't heard otherwise. But um, uh, and feel free to continue this particular conversation about workflow um, because there's always things to talk about with workflow that they don't map onto one particular feature. And so it's like nothing you look up in the manual. They're things you figure out. So I'm always interested in, in hearing other people's ideas about workflow and, and discussing things and how to make things better. Okay, so I will uh, say goodbye and uh, see everyone next time. Bye.